Um, so hello, um, I'm Fiona Steele. Um, first, can I just thank uh, Malcolm, James, Elaine and Claire, if she's here for making this happen. We all very much appreciate it. Um, so I graduated last year from ECA. Um, before that, I studied printmaking. Um, and before that, many months ago, I studied geology. So all of this is kind of is focused through my photography now. Um, since graduating, I have exhibited in the New Contemporaries show and obviously this one. Um, so why do I take images? Well, first and foremost, I'm a lover of nature. Um, I'm a walker, I'm a, a volunteer with a conservation group um, and I love history and storytelling. So this is basically what my photography is about. So some of the themes you can see I'm quite obsessed with dead things. Um, <laughs> um, I've got a sort of network of people who phone me up saying I've got a dead thing for you and then I'll go and collect it. So, or the dead pigeon. Or the dead pigeon I found outside the gallery. Yeah, that was, yeah that's now decomposing in my garden. So my work I think is kind of as much about me as it is the landscape. Kind of explores my feelings at the time as I'm making the work I think. So when I was studying at ECA in third year, I decided to look at this particular landscape, which is where I grew up. And I can't really remember much from my childhood, but the memories I do remember um, were in this landscape. So I thought, it, like most art school students do, they explore where they come from. So I did. So I've been visiting this my whole life and never knew much really about it. And when I delved into it deeper, I found out that there used to be a lot of mining that went on here. There used to be grouse shooting, um, and apparently Winston Churchill would come up and grouse shoot. But what really inspired me was that there was roughly 20 aeroplane crashes. I think it was between the years of 1938 and 1958, and the mist that surrounded this. So one of the reasons was low-lying mist, which is quite obvious, could have contributed. Another thing was um, the pilot's pilot error. Um, these guys were not trained properly and were flying really powerful aircrafts. But what this work is about was a myth that connected the mineral within the land to the crashes. Some people thought that the primitive navigational equipment was affected by the bayrite, this mineral here, bayrite, um, which just so happens to be known for its high specific gravity, which is the title of this work. So this is what this is kind of looking at, this sort of myth, mystery, that went on here. I think it's, it's still an ongoing body of work. I kind of see this landscape as somewhere where I could do my creative process for the rest of my life and always go back and do it in the same landscape. And it's like different chapters exploring the different sort of points of history. So this is exploring the myth, but it's not finished. I do still have other images. I hope one day it can become a book. Yeah, so that is that. Um, I think as well, what I'd like to point out and this is by no means bragging, but it was the ease that these images have came to me. Most of these were took over the period of maybe a month or two, and they, they were so easy for me to take, which is not normal. But I think that ease has came from the three or four years research previous. <laughs> so I say it's only took me two months to take the images, but in actual fact, I've been researching it for three years. So like, take this one, for instance. That is the shadow of a doorway from an old barn. It's called Heathfield Farm. And interestingly, one of the planes that came down was a swordfish, and it was three American pilots that were on it. And at the time, there was no access to this, these moorlands. So what they did was the, the locals put the dead bodies in this barn until the RAF could come and remove them. So that's just a little story about that image. Pick another one. This, is, this image was taken during the Beast from the East. While people were moaning about it, I was out there traipsing through knee-high snow, um, loving it. So like, I think my photography as well, like, when people wouldn't normally go out with the cameras, that's when I'm out there with my camera, um, abusing it and using it. So how has MPG benefited me? I think it's been great hearing from previous members. I think what was kind of emphasised was to push your boundaries, do something, try something that is not normally what you would do. And I've done that by using digital. This, these are all digital images. Before that, I was always using medium format or large, large format. And to be honest, I was kind of forced into doing that as well through being completely skint after graduating. Um, but 
I'm really happy with the results. Um, it's a body of work that I will continue with and hopefully make a book from it. Um, yeah, and I think that's enough for me. <laughs> Okay, hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, so I'm Kat Thompson. Um, I'm a photographer based in Edinburgh. Um, I graduated from Edinburgh College in 2016, so it's been a couple years now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about my approach to la la the, the theme of latitude, sorry, and um, also being part of the MPG, um, about the process, um, cause for me, I'm only exhibiting three photographs here, but there was quite a lengthy process to get to these three. So first of all, uh, my approach to the theme Latitude was to take it in the same sense that our um, title Elbow Room is. Um, so it's like scope for freedom or action of thought. So I decided to try um, and incorporate this feeling into um, the actual process of making the images. So a lot of my previous works were very like prescriptive. I always had a very definite idea of what they were gonna look like. The briefs were quite certain, whereas this brief for me was quite broad because it was just one word. My other images were also, they were always shot in digital. They were always in a studio. They all had very controlled kind of lighting setups. Um, I would pick models, you know, because maybe of the way they looked aesthetically or even just like their hair color or whatever. And everything was really controlled. And as Fiona said earlier, um, when we joined the MPG, they were quite keen to kind of push us out of our comfort zones a little bit. So I decided for the first time ever, I was gonna shoot medium format film um, and only use natural light to produce the images, um, <laughs> which I think some people think is maybe the easier way to do things, but for me it was actually much more difficult to kind of let myself just keep it loosely and kind of try and organically follow a process. So in that vein of trying to help these things kind of unfold organically, I kind of went into this series of portraits quite openly I did five photo shoots in all with different people. Um, and in every case, I asked them to pick a location that meant something to them that they're like really drawn to. Um, this is Portobello Beach in Edinburgh for anyone that doesn't know that. I told them just to wear whatever they felt comfortable in. And then when we got to the location, we would try and use elements of the location to create images. I usually was with them for like an hour and it was kind of just like having a play and seeing what worked for them. I hope that by doing this kind of um, much more less controlled environment than I'm used to, that the sitters all kind of like see a semblance of themselves in the photographs. I wanted to capture a representation that felt true to them in some way, because um, quite often with portraiture, I'm not sure if much of it is truth. Um, and this was trying to get closer to the truth than I have previously. Yeah, so I was trying to give them like a sense of autonomy over the actual process of image making. Something else I want to talk about here is the tracing paper in the middle. I've been asked a lot about why I decided to add tracing paper to the images. For me, most of the reason is really because I wanted to highlight like the craft that goes into making a photograph, um, especially you know like in this day and age when everyone can just like take their cam their phone rather and like point and shoot. And I think sometimes people forget that behind the images there is quite a lengthy process of development. And I just, maybe not that subtle, but just wanted to, you know, remind people that there was a person there consciously making decisions along with the model um, on the day. Another reason is I like the physicality of the paper. I like the fact that it like moves in the space and people, as you can see, like pick it up sometimes and they can interact with the image. And it's not just something stuck on a wall, but it is something that if they want to, they can try and interact a little bit with it. The models I picked, I didn't pick them rather, um, I kind of just did a social media call out. Um, some people heard about it through friends um, and it was kind of just first come first serve and yet everything was trying to sort of be as organic as possible. This day we kind of lucked out, um, you can see in this photograph there was like this really thick fog on Portobello Beach that day which we weren't expecting, we were going there anyway, but I think it kind of adds something to the element of the photographs um, and I can kind of reflect that back to the tracing paper as well. I want to talk about a bit about the MPG. Um, I mainly decided to apply to be part of the MPG because I was working a lot in photography, but I wasn't really making any images for myself. And it was really, for me, like a push towards making a personal project. And I kind of forgot sometimes how difficult it is to like, put yourself out there in that way because you're representing something that you're quite happy with, but you never know what people's reactions are going to be to that. And in commercial work, it's a lot more prescriptive and prescribed, and that's what I'm used to but I think the whole process has been really useful to me. 
And I just want to say thank you to James and Elaine and Claire, wherever you are, <laughs> and also to Malcolm Street Level, because it has just been a really good experience. And that's me. Uh, so, my project, I took the word latitude to, as you can see, is the display. Uh, and it was pretty integral to every single part of the whole project, to the way I found them, to shot them, and uh, camera placements and distances and, and stuff. But anyway, uh, I used it to highlight an issue, and it's the... Uh, Invite consideration of the impact of humanity's consumption of the Earth's natural resources in order to sustain our collective society. Exploring the way we consume by focusing on the extraction and processing of minerals required by heavy industry and placing them in barren and waste land, maybe suggesting that we're kind of at a tipping point or a breaking point in that. But the idea came to me and I was in a family holiday in Pitt and Weem, which I was quite apprehensive about uh, going to because I still hadn't really come up with my idea for the project, so I was scared to get away from my computer and my research and stuff like that. But I'm, I'm quite glad I did because if you go to Pitt and Meme, there's not a lot to photograph. Once you've photographed a lobster pot, you photograph them all. <laughs> so <laughs> I found myself doing it at the harbour, uh, and it was quite a choppy night, and I had a flash, put the camera on the rear, slow shutter speeds, just trying to get some movement and sort of freeze the flash. And the, the, the waves were quite rhythmical. Yeah, every six or seven, there was this big wave came in and crashed on the harbour wall. And you could feel the impact of it and stuff. And I, I used to work in construction and I says to myself, well, that, God, that mar marine concrete has taken some powder and it must be solid. And then it gave me a thought that, hold on a minute, we're holding nature back with natural natural resources and like making concrete to hold it back, you know? And this was at the same time that the refraction plant in Moss Morin had a flaring issue. So the whole sky was apocalyptic. And that's when the idea of kind of focusing on the way we consume Earth's natural resources was to project my project almost. But it was also inspiration for a few quotes that I uncovered in a previous project, which is pretty similar to this, and it was facts like, like the recent construction boom in Africa has taken sand as a more precious natural commodity than water, and they're, they're taking it for riverbeds and they're displacing rivers, which is causing irrigation problems for, for the rest of the year and stuff, and I thought that's a bit sort of full on. And the reason why there's just lots of discoveries in the deep ocean for all these kind of creatures that science has not kind of found before is that there's plans to mine the seabed for kind of minerals and resources that we need in modern life. And I thought, geez, if the ocean goes, then we're away pretty quickly. And another one, it's like Apple have got this new technology for communicating and they can't get enough of the components, like lithium and components to make the battery so that they have to shelve it until they get enough to make a profit. So that's, these are the kind of facts that inspired my whole project. But the original idea was to photograph structures and installations that were surrounded by agricultural land, because like, I'd, I'd read once that probably the most nat unnatural event to have happened to the earth is farming or agriculture, and it, we need that three times a day. Do you know what I mean? But with the timing of the exhibition and the timing of harvest, it meant it wasn't going to happen. So I decided to kind of try and find barren and, and kind of wasteland. And I kind of based it on a movie I watched in the 80s and recently kind of looked at it again. And it's uh, Andrew Tarkovsky's Stalker, where there's a zone where an event's happened. So I tried to kind of find these places that would, that would suit that kind of, that kind of look. Uh, but I was always out with this kind of one phrase in my head that the horizon is bleak for consumption. So I kind of think that we having that it allowed me to choose these. And it was quite a laborious kind of project because it was probably over 30 locations that I went to to try and find five or six or seven, you know, and it was pretty physical. Like, and I was using public transport to keep my carbon footprint down. So that meant like some of these, the distance walking was 12 miles before I even took my camera out of the bag, you know, and 
having to wander about to find the right, the right place to put the camera, the right height, and everything else that would match my whole series. But to be honest, I, I love the challenge. It, it complements my logistical brain, you know. It's a going out with everything, research and searching on maps and taking ordnance survey maps where you're reading the land and stuff. It's just, it was hard, but it's, it's such a pleasure. But the best thing was when I was out there and the feeling of solitude, almost like the last man alive, I think helped in the project as well because there's like, the only things that I was coming across were dead sheep or half dead sheep. I tried to rescue this dead, dead sheep once and I think it just wanted to die. And I think Muriel, a couple of days I really kind of, I was in a downer because I, I couldn't help it, you know, type of thing. So I think that helped in the kind of, the bleakness of it that I was out there and I felt as if I was kind of uncovering secrets. I felt that this was finished until after the opening night and we were kind of, after the opening night and we've had seven months of, of getting mentored and coming, coming through every month and meeting up with the mentees and stuff and being influenced with your project, which Claire and Elaine and James are just perfect at, they just guide you in, the, in that route. And, but looking at it, it's, it's pretty similar to my previous project, which is quite apocalyptic. I set it in a Mad Max future. But I was also thinking that because I wanted to do it with agricultural land, then it's not going to stop. It's going to be a chapter of four. So hopefully it's either a bigger exhibition or a book where it's, it'll be agricultural land, wasteland, and then hopefully winter land if we get snow this year, and then the apocalyptic one. So uh, that's what's been great about being mentored, that you, that you see that you've done this work, so much potential ahead to, to, to expand it. I've just been allowed to exhibit in, in street level, it's just, it's just amazing. Uh, uh, the, the mentor, was, it was brilliant, it, it gave you a chance, because I think when you, when you graduate, it's quite lonely when you try to come up with projects. And as, as Kat was saying, you don't know if it's good or you need that kind of peership, you know? So it, it's good to get that inclusion. And I think, Somebody had said it earlier, we're a wee band and I think we will all stick together, you know, type of thing. I don't see any of us rushing to delete my WhatsApp account, you know, so, <laughs> so uh, anyway, that's me, so that, that's it. Who's next? Hello, um, I'm Helen, Helen Jones. Um, bit nervous but it's nice to see you thank you for all coming it really means a lot so that's really great I'm a graduate of uh, Napier University in Edinburgh um, and also GSA here in Glasgow this is the first thing that I've freshly made since graduating so this is quite a big um, time for me basically with this project unlike Monty who went outside and did lots of <laughs> climbing up mountains and things um, I actually stayed inside for this one um, and the project which is called Archive 16 actually came from a, a roll of film that was given to me by a friend's mother. And uh, it was a really old roll from, it's called Code of Colour C20. I think it's from about, produced in about the 50s, I think they discontinued it after the 70s. Um, the exact date's on the, the form there. And she said, can you process this, see if you can find anything, might be exciting, might be nothing, we don't know. But because you're, you're not allowed, we, there's nowhere in Britain that you can process that now. So I went to Stills and um, Evan and I developed uh, a way to hand develop it, basically. So at Stills, we, had a, we spent quite a lot of time in the darkroom testing different temperatures and things. That's the main difference, is the temperature um, that you process the film at. So after doing that, I scanned them, because I, I really loved them. I found some images that I really loved. And then I wasn't sure what to do with them, really, after that. Um, I thought, this is, you know, they're amazing, but I don't know what to do. On the film roll, I was really fortunate I think in what I found, because out of the 16 frames, I found six frames that were really interesting to me. I found a day trip, which was with the car, an outing by the beach, and I also found, which aren't in this display, I found some photographs from a funeral, which to me seemed quite a bizarre combination of things to all be on one roll of film. But this was also what was really interesting, because for me it meant that all those events became equal, because they're all on the same sheet of film. So from that point, I started working with the images. I went to the dark room, which I haven't done for a really long time. Um, I actually brought the first one, which I did, which was this one, which was a bit of an accident. And I, <laughs> I pulled it out of the machine and I sort of thought, oh, that's, that's not what I was expecting. <laughs> and then, so 
gradually I tried to work out what had happened because I hadn't color printed for about 15 years, which is quite a while, but I was a bit gung-ho and thought I could do it anyway. I actually made some notes that said um, things I've learned in the darkroom, so I'll just read you them. Um, the first thing was you need to put a lens in the enlarger. <laughs> Second thing was you need to focus it. The third thing, this is a really good tip, was that you have to open the aperture to focus and then you can stop back down. But I didn't know that, so for the first lot, I kept trying to focus it and couldn't actually do it. So it felt a bit silly. And the next thing I found out was that too much light makes your image black. And that actually became basically one of the pieces really for me. Because during the process at MPG, the person who initially gave me the roll of film said she didn't want me to exhibit any of the work from it. And through numerous conversations with James and other people, lots of crying and tears and <laughs> not knowing what you should do, in the end, my resolution actually was to make a piece that was actually basically all black. So I used all the negatives and overexposed them all. And that's how I got the, the black uh, shapes. And then as a part of a conversation with the, uh, the pieces, I thought I'd make this one, which actually shows you the color images. Um, I spent a bit of time adjusting the colors to try and get this feel. I tried to do it in Photoshop and it's, you can't get the same, the same kind of uh, result. Um, the reason I've chosen the car as the one that you see the most in this piece um, is because that one for me feels really special because it's a snapshot and it's almost like an accident. And I think that, that the way that we take images now, the way that we photograph things, we probably delete a lot of those. But actually, if you think back to this one, I think everybody has a memory of going on a car, on a journey. Even though the memory changes over time, you still have that memory. So that's everything. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Joel Dixon. I graduated from London College of Communication a few years ago. Moved to Glasgow just nine months ago, just in time to apply for the New Photographers Guild. And this, um, why did I never realise before that that was beautiful too? It's a series of self-portraits that looks at the performative nature of sexual identity. The title is taken from Andre Gide's novel, The Immoralist in which the central character tells himself, I've always thought that great artists were those who dared to confer the right of beauty on things so natural that people say on seeing them, why did I never realize before that that was beautiful too? When I rediscovered the quote after looking through old notes to help contextualize the work, it seemed to articulate something about the images in much fewer words than I'd been able to do myself. The work I like to tell people is about the ways in which history and power structures shape the everyday, that is, the way in which we think and understand the world as being the result of a long history of changing cultural and societal beliefs. This makes looking subjectively at images of nudity difficult, as public displays and artistic portrayals of nudity are something that have been highly moderated, restricted and censored throughout art and society for centuries. I'm interested in the male body and the history of its representation and I employ a visual language from its usage in art and literature, combined with text pulled from various sources to challenge and critique current trends in thought. That is how we understand the male body, nudity and gender in a patriarchal Anglo-Christian society. My intentions through this critique are to highlight a larger problem that we have in the West, which is the over-sexualization of the encounter with the naked body and the pervasion of the, idea of the ideal body. As a consequence, we have body shaming and the celebration of certain body types over others, um, an anxiety-inducing symptom of a capitalist society which profits from making people feel good or bad about the way that they look. What I hope to do through addressing these ideas and using my body, um, my own body to make a political statement in a public space is to empower people to take ownership of their own bodies and the ways in which they perform their sexuality both publicly and privately. My interest in photography has its roots in the medium's history. When I was younger, I was particularly influenced by the early modernist photographers. So we have those associated with the Bauhaus school, particularly Laszlo Moholy Nagy, as well as others across Europe, such as Andre Cortez and Man Ray, and those operating in America at the turn of the 20th century, um, Edward Weston, Alfred Stieglitz. 
One thing that always seemed to unify each of these photographers was their use of strong lines and the theatricality of their use of light and shadow that gave the images their depth. As a result of this engagement, I have always been very aware of the image's surface, by which I mean the formal arrangements of the space within the frame, as well as the dramatic potential of light and shadow. My attraction to a space because of its formal elements will always be the starting point from which I construct an image. The second challenge will be how to frame the space, and the third challenge will be how to disrupt this formal arrangement. Um, how can I position myself within the frame, within the space, and challenge the viewer? Or how can I present something of an internal self? I'm also interested in the possibilities of blurring the boundaries between public and private space. And I think that when you start doing so, you're really able to start challenging people. That is in a way that makes them ask questions of themselves or of society or of the people around them. I think it's at this point that we can take the conversation back to the body because how we see the body in both public and private spaces is still highly moderated. I want to talk a bit now about my body and my body in these images. Photography or the act of photographing or the photograph, I think in some circles is still thought of and in some respects is a direct copy of an object or a space. In my case, the camera frame is a stage and I'm performing. Don't let yourself be fooled into thinking that, w that this is what I look like um, underneath my clothes. The images are highly staged and the poses, while I try and make them work as natural as possible, are often really hard to hold, even for the time that it takes to make the photograph. So I think what, what I'm dancing around in bringing this up is photography's ability to produce fictions and its ability to allow us to present something how we want to present it and its ability to allow us to create our own spaces. There's a tension between the desire to liberate the body and the artifice that is required to achieve this. I've been asking myself what I think this tension is and why does it exist? And I still don't have an answer. I think it's that tension that drives the work, and it's through making the work that I feel I'm getting closer to understanding why and where this tension lies. I think there's something to be said for photography or painting or any other art form as being a language in its own right. And the entire reason that I make the work that I make is that I'm not able to articulate in words what it is that I want to communicate. And maybe once I am able to, then it'll be time to move on. What I presented for the New Photographers Guild feels certainly feels like part of a much larger body of work and is something that I can see myself working on for quite a long time. I'm already working on new images. Um, I'm just taking steps towards making a book, which um, I would like to produce myself. I'll produce all of the prints for the book in the dark room and hand bind each copy. The work and the images is something that I'm really invested in and it's something that I really give a lot of myself to. And so it makes sense for me to be involved in each stage of the production. I'll reintroduce colour to the images through the use of oil paints, which is something that I've done in previous work. Um, and it's something that I'm keen to explore again. At that time, I was particularly interested in this idea of sanctity and the use of blue and gold in religious iconography, which again is something that I'd like to revisit. That's inspired by the following quote from Jean Genet which is the fame of heroes owes little to the extent of their conquests and all to the success of the tributes paid to them. That's it. My name's Daniel White, and this is my project Tales of Unearthly. Um, I'm a recent graduate from City of Glasgow College in um, 2017. I've recently had exhibitions at the Royal Scottish Academy and the RSE Open, Full Photo Fest in Inverness, Print, Island Print Studio, and with the college, I was at Free Range, London. My work's basically involved around dreams and meaning of place. My work always has a strong connection with place. As previous works, I try to explore place and history. It's an important component in which I pick a topic to explore. The place needs to have a connection or a fascination like this. This is all based on the celestial triangle of a latitude line. The place is Falkirk, from which we originate where Bonniebridge and other areas of Fife and Falkirk have the most celestial activity in the UK. When making this work for the Guild and following a loose brief of latitude, I wanted to create the Celestial Project and I wanted to connect to the place. This is a place that I visit quite a lot and I feel it's a quite 
creepy space where certain aliens or anything or that sort of magnitude could maybe visit. I did not, I did not want to make a stereotypical alien project that looks fake, like documented like films where there's flying saucers in there, so I wanted to keep it real. I wanted it to be a performance act where I was envisioning being an alien or some sort of amorphous creature roaming around the woods like a wildcat. Um, I have made stills for this project um, over the course of five months, but I felt the stills didn't represent the body of work that I, that I felt it was Celeste. I felt it had to be like a moving project. I never really made any moving image when at university. Um, never explored it at all until I came to the guild, where my fellow mentees said that I should actually explore moving image as my work seen as more cinematic. So this was the first time I've ever shot a video, and this is why I wanted to be on the guild, to, exp to experiment and explore different methods and techniques, which I felt the mentees and the mentors helped with a lot. There's always something unsettling about the, the unknown and the link of the middle. It's there, but no one quite knows what, what, where it is. We live with this uncertainty every day, and I hope this is conveyed in the project I have made, that there's an uncertain world. There's a link between the real and the unreal but we don't know if it's actually living beside us or if it's actually something we don't know what it looks like. I wanted to include gold in the project, as Scotland has the most, um, the most gold count in the whole, well, the whole UK. So gold is not a derived earthly product that falls from the sky from an explosion. So having gold in the project linked to the whole celestial experience of something falling from the sky Landing on the Earth, a specific part of the Earth where the Bonnie Ridge and Falkirk is most known for celestial experiences, linking that with something coming out of the sky, falling on the land, hatching out the gold, and moving around the land like a human would, exploring the land, kind of like a, an experience where people see in the woods. They say they see, they see a Bigfoot or a, a cat. It's known, it's known quite a lot, but nobody really believes it, so it's like a found footage sort of a video. That's it. <laughs> First of all, I want to say thank you everyone for coming. Um, I think we're all quite overwhelmed by the big group of people and um, so thank you for taking the time this Saturday and listening to all our different projects. Um, my name is Katie Hundertmark um, and as you can maybe hear, I'm half German and I moved to Glasgow th about three years ago um, to do my master's at the art school uh, in a course that's called I'm lit for photography and filmmaking. Um, I actually studied with Helen, so it was nice to um, be able to spend some more time with her on the NPG course. My interest in photography started out quite clearly with the staged image, um, and I was always quite interested in sets, theatre productions, and, and the way that you can kind of subtly create an environment within a picture or within a traditional photograph that can add to its story or, or add to the narrative within the story. And I started out mainly using the image as a stage and placing myself within that image. Along the lines from what Joel was speaking about, kind of performing for the camera um, and adapting different roles or slipping into different stories and histories in order to then attain some kind of better understanding or just have a, a context or a frame um, in which to, to play and um, to move. Um, so, but this work is kind of the most sculptural thing I've ever done. Um, I used to stick to two-dimensional images quite a lot, but I guess throughout the course of the Masters um, and the influence of the Glasgow School of Art mostly, um, I was much more interested in sculpture and the materiality, I guess, um, of sets and scenography. So this is an installation made of uh, steel, um, wallpaper, um, and photographic images and basically what I try to do or what I have done <laughs> is to create a, a photograph that you can actually step inside and use as a stage um, and I don't know if anyone has taken the time yet <laughs> to walk around so this installation works with um, an effect called the anamorphic effect basically um, and if you find a specific vantage point which is um, kind of where I aligned the photograph up to my own camera you can see the picture flipping into the frame, you can, you get the feeling as if I'm touching into, into an image. I mean, if you're interested, we can, we can test that afterwards. A small hint is that this is the vantage point. <laughs> <laughs> and so the title Spielraum, um, which is the direct German translation of the word latitude, 
or one of the different uh, translations. In English means something like room for play or scope for play. Um, and I initially had the, the thought to uh, translate what my interpretation of latitude was into the 35 millimeter film, which is something you'll be able to see in my little part of the publication. So to, to use the frame itself as latitude and I guess from a, a very abstract point of view to, to try and think what different stories, what different stages, what different content a frame can actually hold in itself. What actually transpired to be the work is just one, one small perspective, one vantage point on that scale of, of latitude for me. And when it comes to the image itself, basically it's a, a progression, it's a series of uh, five images where I gradually manipulated the, the canvas, I would say. And again, it was, it was that play with the picture as some kind of material, as if I could literally reach into it and, and mess up mud. Basically, I was playing around in mud. It was quite funny to create the stage. The piece is uh, definitely a work in progress. And um, in my dreams, I see an even bigger, <laughs> an even bigger stage. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the first elaboration or the first idea of, um, of the image as a stage. Um, to finish this off, I could maybe say that I'm working on another performance piece at the moment that will open end of July in Edinburgh in a place called Doc Artist Space. So if any of you Edinburgh-based people are there, you're more than welcome and um, I'll get it out there on the internet as well. <laughs> um, so the NPG or the New Photographer's Guild process for me was quite an interesting one because I basically started out thinking I was going to do a fashion portfolio which pretty quickly I changed my mind and, and had a look yeah, at, at what it is about maybe fashion and the staged image that actually interests me and it's the actual physical thing. I learned how to weld for the NPG. This is hand welded and hand spray painted. So feel free to come closer and have a look, but please don't touch it because <laughs> it's very fragile. Um, if you have any questions, I'm here. I think that's me. And of course, thank you again to all our mentors and Malcolm and Street Level and the whole team that's been documenting and taking pictures and supporting us. Thank you. <laughs>